You're listening to The Quad, a Killjoys podcast. My name is Annie. And I'm Chris. And I'm Stephanie. In this episode, we are discussing the season two premiere of Killjoys, Dutch and the Real Girl. While we will talk about anything and everything from that episode, there will not be any spoilers for future episodes. So let's get started with our quick reviews. I loved this episode, which should be no surprise to anybody who listened to our episodes about the first season because I'm like a massive Killjoys fan. <laughs> I mean, not that I'm <laughs> loving it blindly or anything. I thought they did a really great job of continuing where the first season left off. They throw us right back into the action. I didn't expect any less, but it's still it's still nice when they start off strong like this. But the bond of the team is still front and center, and Pre gets to join them on the mission, which is exciting. And we learn a little bit more about Klein, even though, as expected, like really it just leads to more questions. But I like how much they've complicated his role in the story, like in the story and in Dutch's life, like they've made it all very, very complicated. And I kind of like that about it. Also, I really like Clara, and I want her to come back. Because, I mean, they, they left the door wide open for a return, so I'm excited about it. Yeah, I agree. I Clara was a big, big, big two thumbs up for me in this episode. I thought this was a really strong season premiere. It followed up on little plot elements that were left over from the season one finale, as well as, I think, set up at least three pretty good potential plot threads for this season. And like you said, I thought it was great seeing Pre taking a strong role in this week's mission. And I I love Clara. I am here for the girl with the robot arm. Please come back soon. Please, please, please. So, yay, the Killjoys are back and I'm so happy. I think, you know, when you haven't watched something in a while, you, you don't realize how much you miss it until it mm-hmm. comes back. I've been marathoning the first season, so... Well, I, I hadn't even been doing that, and I was watching this episode going, oh my god, I love this show. I love this show so much to see how, as you said, how strong the bond is between the team and just Johnny and Pre. I, I don't know who I ship more, Johnny and Pre, haha, or Clara and Lucy, or Alice and Johnny. <laughs> I just, you know, I... <laughs> It was so fun. <laughs> so Andy ships everybody with everybody. I do, I do, I do. And uh, as it's you guys said, it's the incredibly said, shippable ship. It is with a literal <laughs> ship in the ship. That's what I'm and saying, Annie. That's that's the joke I'm making. <laughs> of course, I don't get the joke, but uh, I really liked, as you guys did, the introduction of Clara, and I hope she comes back and has an even more badass arm. I mean, I like Alice, but. <laughs> I was just like, ooh, and Dutch being her usual badass self, but I I like how she still has a, you know, a blind spot when it comes to Klein and isn't inclined to believe Davin, but I like how Davin's seeing this other side of Klein and it's very complicated and there seems to be this storyline building that maybe the rack isn't all it's been made up to be and how I think the Killjoys might question their employers. So what's what's going on? Yeah, I think some good, good stuff is getting set up. I loved it. Well, since you both were talking about Klein, let's maybe start with that little plot thread involving Klein and Davin on Arkin. I gotta ask y'all, do, were you surprised that they kind of got uh, Davin off of Arkin so quickly? Like, in the first episode, they rec- rescued him. Was that a surprise to either of you? It was a little bit. I think it was also a surprise that it had only been five days. I- initially, when I was watching the um, the season one finale, I thought it would take like a month or even a couple months for them to infiltrate Arkin or to even find out that Arkin was the place they had to go. Because Dutch was saying, all the leads are pointing towards Arkin. And I'm like, well, where did they get these leads in the first place? Uh, Yeah, I was a little surprised that it was five days, but that's a good thing too, considering that they were trying to turn Davin into a level six so quickly. So Time was of the essence. How about you, Chris? I was surprised and I wasn't. Yeah, me too. I think I felt that way too. I mean, it's it's one of those things, especially given the way – Dutch was acting. She's like, it's been five days. And like in Mm -hmm. every other show, that's the same way everybody else says it's been two months. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) So I think that's the thing that maybe, maybe what Annie's getting at, expecting it to be a couple months. Cause it seems like in every other show, the hiatus, they usually say it's been a couple of months, right? Yeah. It seems like that's sort of the standard kind of a thing. So I, 
I don't know. I like With that it's been five days. With the exception of Orphan Black, in which case it's been five seconds. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think part of what it makes it make so much sense to me that it's been five days and that they've got it narrowed down to Arkin. They knew it was going to be in the quad, probably. You know, there's like a limited amount of space they can really check, you know? Mm -hmm. I don't know. It made a lot of sense to me. And I also think that had they spent an episode or even two or more episodes with Dutch and Johnny tracking down leads, it's kind of boring, right? Like, yeah. we do want to see our team reunited sooner rather than later. You know, now that I think about it, like, okay, fine. I don't really need to see the leads that they track down. We've seen that they have contacts and they can follow up on, oh, where you think they might have gone. Okay, we've we've seen them do that before. So it's okay, I think, that they took a shortcut with off screen, a couple of days went by and they were following leads and they decided, okay, he must be on Arkin. Right. I think that's part of it too, is this show especially seems to burn through plot a lot. Like they, things move pretty quickly. Yeah. Which I appreciate about it. They don't, yeah. they don't linger unnecessarily. And so this actually also provides an opportunity. I don't know that they're going to do this, but they could, if they wanted to later in the season, be like, oh, we're going to go back to whoever, who we talked to when you were on Arkin, like he's, mm -hmm. you know, this person led us to Davin, you know, they can, they can revisit it later in a way where it, we know that's the thing that happened, but we don't have to see them doing that, you know? That's mm -hmm. true. I could totally see them being approached by some shady person and they're like, oh, we got to do this job for for him or her because they gave us information about finding Davin. Like I could see that being the setup for a mission maybe later in the season if they wanted to do that. Right. And, and it is only 10 episodes and they do have to write things pretty, cons you know, tightly. And this isn't 22 episode seasons anymore. So yeah, I can see why they wrote it the way they did. You know, I mean, I know Stephanie hates flashbacks, but they could do a brief flashback <laughs> to <laughs> some other thing that uh, Davin remembers from his time on Arkin. Because at the beginning, when he's having all these flashes, I'm like, are they flashbacks? Are they memories? So I like that they clarified that it was a memory, that whole battle sequence he was seeing with uh, the Scarbacks. Mm -hmm. Which I have so many questions about. How long did it take y'all to kind of clue into the fact that, oh, this is a, a dream or like a simulation or something that he was experiencing? Pretty In the beginning, immediately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at the beginning, I was like, wait a minute. You know, I'm pretty gullible, but once the... Uh, I'm a gullible, dumb viewer, okay, people. But at the opening sequence, once the uh, music swelled and the sparks keep flying, and I'm like, this is a little ridiculous. I, I did think it was funny, though. I liked it. I thought that was great. <laughs> yeah. Because it's, it's one of those I'm things, like, there it. are the signals that stuff isn't quite right before that. You know, mm -hmm. he has the flash of Fancy Lee when he sees him. And, and like, as soon as you see Fancy Lee, you're kind of like, this isn't right. I mean, if you weren't thinking it before. Yeah, that's that was my cue. I was like, wait a minute. Because, it, yeah, it starts off and you're kind of like, hang on now. What? When did they already save him? And yeah, they, yeah. they're talking like they did. And then you're kind of like, this doesn't feel right. And then Fancy Lee shows up and you're like, no, <laughs> <laughs> something is wrong. <laughs> but I thought we got some really interesting revelations about Klein and potentially the rack in this little story thread. And and especially Klein, like, I am surprised how much I love Klein as a character. I think he's a terrible person, but... <laughs> he's terrible, <laughs> but, I but really he's great. Like, yeah, he's <laughs> terrible, but he's great. But I think they've made him really interesting. Yeah. They're they're doing sort of a thing, like, like as, as Stephanie and I have been talking about with Rachel and Orphan Black. He's a bad person. <laughs> he's doing terrible things, but he's very, very interesting, which makes him a good character. He's very because compelling. Yeah. Because there's all this stuff going on where we don't really quite know what his motives are. Mm -hmm. And we know he's doing certain things to protect Dutch, but the way he's doing them is so upsetting to me. <laughs> because he's, <laughs> I mean, he's so controlling. Mm -hmm. The whole thing, like, he's he's terrible, but at the same time, he's protecting our beloved Dutch. So it's one of those things I have conflicted feelings about it. He's got a, almost a pure motivation, but it comes out in a very terrible way. I'm just going to pop a cap on all these people and <laughs> get get Davin out. And he's straight, you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's how they talk in the quad, popping caps. Yeah. <laughs> well, he did. But, but I thought it was interesting. <laughs> I didn't quite understand why Klein wasn't healing it when Dav stabbed him through the hand and then later he did. 
Well, that was the thing. That was the thing they were warning him about was there was something different about Davin because he was resistant to the green goo, whatever the green goo is supposed to do. Because Davin stabbed Klein with the thing that was inserted into his spine. Oh, so it had so some that of had like, like had contact with him Davin. and his DNA and his biology, and so that was the distinction. Like when Davin stabbed him with that thing, he didn't heal, but he healed from the bullets, which had no contact with Davin. Yep, got it. And that's a that's an interesting little plot twist there, the fact that Davin seemed to be immune from the indoctrinating level six green goo. But is that I mean, good or bad? See, now I'm kind of exactly <laughs> worried for... But I'm worried because the stuff, is it even... Is it still in Davin? Did it get in him? How is he immune? Was it his whole head shrink thing from last season with all the neuroblockers or the nanites? Poor Dav, he has a lot of stuff running through his system. <laughs> He's kind yeah. of like Spike from Buffy the Vampire Slayer in that way. <laughs> he's got a trigger. He's got a, and he's got trigger a chip, and chip in and- a soul. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I have a lot of questions about that, too, because my current working theory is that it has to do with the nanites from last season. Granted, there's all sorts of stuff we know we don't know from his soldier days, clearly. Right. So it could be something from that, but it seems likely to me... Again, I don't know. From what we've seen at this point, the nanites seem like the logical choice, which would mean that Dutch is also immune. So I was going to say, because they, they enter Dutch as well. So she would be immune from becoming a level six. Well, I'm wondering if whatever Dav has in his system, if that's more powerful or effective than the green goo that makes people a level six, or is it a disadvantage? The thing is, the nanites, or whatever it is, I shouldn't say it's the nanites, we don't know that. Whatever it is that has kept Davin from getting infected by the green goo means that he's still susceptible to the things that the green goo protects from. Yeah. <laughs> right? Because, like, yeah, I know. they cut his hand and he he bled, so, you know, you can still get injured, whereas the green goo would protect you from injury. But at the same time, the green goo seems to brainwash you. So at least he doesn't have that. Yeah, it's complicated. It's a it's a trade-off. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought that was an interesting writing choice that they made. The fact that we saw Klein take Davin to Arkin. And like, oh, Klein's a bad guy. He's doing this thing to Davin. And yet he was instrumental in rescuing Davin from the same place he took him to. I can't decide if that's a brilliant writing choice or a weird one. Maybe it's both. I don't know. <laughs> but I think Klein is just flying under the radar and he's trying to you know, maybe subvert what's going on with Iraq and level six by infiltrating it. And he, maybe he had no choice but to take Davin there or he was doing it just to, as he said, turn Davin into a level six so he could protect Dutch. But he wasn't expecting Davin to be immune to the green goo. There's the whole thing with the the black root. Whatever that is. Right. I would imagine that would be something above a level six, or maybe one of the few things that can control a level six, who we've seen to be immune to knives and bullets and things. Right. Something that is but, controlling or, the or like an organization, or, I mean, I don't know. But the fact that whoever those guys were, they came in and they said to Klein, like, it's an honor to meet you, and Klein's all, I'm sure it is, and then they conk him over the head. <laughs> And electrocute him, yeah. Because, like, to me, this is sort of, like, the same thing that you were just saying, Stephanie, about saving Davin and trying to get him away from the place where he was trying to alter him. And, you know, like, the whole, <laughs> it sort of seems counterintuitive, I guess is what mm -hmm. I'm saying. And I guess it's maybe a suggestion that uh, of what Davin tells Dutch later on, that really he is an ally to Dutch first and foremost. Mm -hmm. So... He took Devin there because he thought he could level six him and then he could protect Dutch. When he realized that was not a possibility, his priorities shifted like, okay, you can go because this plan isn't going to work. I'm going to come up with a plan B. Right. That's certainly yeah. what it sounded like. And it sounds like Klein in some way is trying to work within the system to achieve whatever his goals are. But I wonder how he's going to get out of the pickle he's in now. Who's this lady he's going to? Why did Fancy stab the guard who was watching over Klein, and what is he doing in this whole thing? I'm guessing, though I don't know, that Fancy Lee is loyal to Klein. Hmm. Yeah, that was my big question, is how we were supposed to interpret Fancy's actions at the end of the episode. Because it seems like the other guy was probably a Blackroot guy, 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. But Fancy Lee is a level six, one would assume created by Klein and therefore loyal to him. I don't know. This is me guessing based on what we've seen. But when you yeah. create a level six, how do you ensure who they're loyal to? Well, we saw from what Davin was going through that they introduce memories or something to them. So it does seem like there's some sort of, I don't know, indoctrination. But Davin's whole experience with Klein on Arkin, it leads to that really interesting conversation that he has with Dutch at the end of the episode where he tries to tell her, I don't think Klein is your enemy. And I loved that exchange between the two of them. Mm -hmm. That was one of my favorite moments of the episode. And I tweeted about it, and then Michelle Lavretta responded with something along the lines of, like, her favorite part of that scene is is Johnny's face in response to that statement, <laughs> which is sort of like a, like a, I think she said, dude, no. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I agree, like, it, it was this moment where I can see both angles of it. I can see why yeah. Dutch doesn't want to hear what Davin has to say about the matter because Davin doesn't know all the experience that she had with Klein. Right. But at the same time, Davin, I think, has some insight into Klein that Dutch might not have. Yeah, because he just went through this whole experience with him and he knows how he wouldn't have made it out otherwise. But I love how Dutch said to him, you know, you don't get a say in that. And mm -hmm. we see her when she's relating her whole history to Clara and we're reminded, you know, again, of how she grew up and how incredibly, you know, traumatizing that must have been. And right. that it's really interesting that a time frame was given. I guess I forgot about it, that she said she escaped Klein six years ago. And I'm like, wow, only six years ago. She which they said his, in the first season. Yeah, I, I'd forgotten about that timeline, which is pretty terrible when you think about it, that she's been under the influence of Klein for most of her life. Yeah, probably at least a decade, if not more. Well, that's the thing, too. Like, we don't actually know how old Dutch is. Mm-hmm. That's true. Hannah John Common, I want to say, is actually kind of on the younger side, isn't she? Yeah, she's mm -hmm. like 24 or 25, I think. Yeah. Somewhere in there. And I would guess the, the girl that they've been using in the flashbacks, 10-ish uh, or so? Yeah. So, I don't yeah. know. So probably. maybe not quite a decade, but a good chunk of her life were spent with Klein training her to be an assassin. There's all this nuance to the relationship between... Dutch and Klein, because, and I, I like that Davin calls him out on it, talking about yeah. how he's got weird daddy issues or mm -hmm. whatever it is that he says. Because it is like he's a weird, controlling father figure. Yeah, that part's kind of creepy. Well, I still wonder, like, do we think he might be her father? <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. because that's that not clear question. yet. There are hints that it could be in the first season, but I don't know. Yeah, we don't know for sure. And he was very upset by this, Davin's comments about his father figure status toward Dutch. But why? Why? I have so many <laughs> questions. <laughs> I gotta say, when, when Klein first talked about the Black Root, and we see toward the end of the episode where they're hauling off his... I think he looked like he was kind of frozen. He was in kind of a frozen stasis type of thing. Yeah, like a stasis pod. Yeah, or something like that. You know, they're carrying him off, and, and I was... In my head, I'm thinking, where are they taking him to? <gasps> Could it be Delcea Kendry? Please be Delcea <laughs> Kendry. And then they mentioned somebody called The Lady. I was like... <gasps> yeah, yeah, that was my thought, too. <laughs> You just want to see Delcea and Dutch together again, Stephanie. Yes. Well, yes, I, I do, do too, but <laughs> she is one I'm hell of a snapper. <laughs> She's a hell of a snapper. I want to see the the unconsummated homoerotic tension. Oh my god. I, I you're so fully funny. admit this. I want them to talk with their <laughs> mouths really close together. I want all the things. <laughs> you are not the only one. I just enjoy hearing you talk about it so enthusiastically. It's so funny. The UST. You're a big fan of the UST. It depends on the on the individuals, but yes, between Dutch and, and Delce Kendry, mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of their UST. <laughs> Unresolved sexual tension in case anybody doesn't know. And I don't actually think that the lady is is Delce Kendry. I, I just don't think so. I was either. holding she's, hopes. She's just that. hoping. Yeah. <laughs> but if it'd be nice plot twist if it was, you never know. Cause the nine are pretty powerful. But please. Please, Michelle Lavretta, please more Delcea Kendry and unresolved sexual tension, please. I'm sure there will be some. I can't imagine there wouldn't be. 
I do not think she'll disappoint. Yeah. But there was a little bit of gay in this episode. <laughs> hey, speaking of UST, I loved the Pre and Johnny UST. Oh my gosh. They were so much fun that together. They made, made a great me laugh team. So hard. <sighs> I'm divorcing you and taking all of your imaginary money. <laughs> that was the lie. Oh God. <laughs> No, my favorite part was when they staged that big fight in the gambling casino, right. and one of the other gambles like, "No, you do not disrespect your man's mother," <laughs> and everybody that was, was all great. Gasp. <laughs> But they were so much fun, and I liked how they managed to fit in a kind of typical mission of the week scenario into mm -hmm. a premiere. Me like, too. It both it felt very premiere like, and yet still like a typical episode in the best way possible. Yeah. Right? Yeah. This show's very good at doing that kind of thing because it does like it. It perfectly melds the you know the mythology, the ongoing storyline of the show with sort of a mission of the week because they have yeah. to go fetch the shield to get to Davin. So they work that in to like the middle of the episode. It's great. I love it. And they do it while still bringing up a ton of new questions about Klein or about the rack or about level six. So, but the whole undercover mission, that to me was some of the best parts of the episode. <laughs> We've had such a lovely time. <laughs> I'm not wearing my Start dying underwear them. today. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, like every mission is an opportunity for fashion. Mm -hmm. And it's fantastic. I was so happy to see Pre be so involved in the mission and to get some backstory on him. Mm -hmm. I loved his what? Like you don't have skeletons? Strokes his head. <laughs> <And> he's all like <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm all show us your skeletons, Pre, that's what I was tweeting. And then <laughs> That's so, that so dirty, dirty. Annie. <laughs> I know, I know. I was rather proud of myself for that one. And he's like, I meant it to be. <laughs> but I can't, because he never really revealed what he was, what he was wanted for, was he? He's a sass nope. thief. Yeah, besides those <laughs> fabulous aliases. <laughs> they did say that it was, um, I think they did mention some crimes. I'm blanking on what they were. Yeah, I don't remember either. But I like that we're finally getting a little background info on Pre. I'd love for his character to become more fleshed out this season. Because while he was great in season one as this little colorful character that added some humor to some scenes. Like literally colorful character. Ex yeah, exactly. And I liked him as like a confidant to Johnny and Davin as the bartender. Like I I'd love for him to become more fleshed out as a character. Because he's our clearly queer character and that the only one that we've got so far. And, well, I guess they will say it too. Uh, but uh, he's the one who's shown up the most. And I I'd love for him to become more rounded out. You just want Del Saya to become more rounded out as a out oh, she's round woman. enough already. Yeah, see? <laughs> <laughs> you want her to round it out with Dutch. That's what you want. I would not say no. <laughs> I don't think Dutch really swings that way, but eh, I can dream. I think given the circumstances, yeah. You never know. She she returns the flirtation. She's more of a sporting flirter, though. Like, you right, know, right. Yeah. So, as always, they have to do an undercover mission, and Dutch chooses a fantastic outfit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which, why? Because <laughs> she was hiding when they entered the... Why not, Chris? I know, I know. Maybe it's so she'd blend in if she got caught. I don't know. But her outfit, we have to comment, since we also have a, a podcast about it's, Orphan Black. It's Neolution Dutch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she she's awesome. looks like a freaky leaky. It's the, the Neolution Dutch. And it seems... I don't know if that they did it on purpose and yet she wore that outfit in an episode in which we are introduced to a character who is is all body mods practically you know a significant portion is body mods so i don't know if it's a purposeful allusion to orphan black but it's it kind of ends up being one whether they meant to or not it's the same production company so that's a good point as as you said <laughs> was it i can't remember if it was you chris or stephanie when we first saw those promo pictures of dutch you're like, yeah, they got those white contacts lying around all over the place. It's definitely That was me. Yeah. They've got the supplies <laughs> on hand. They might as well. So Freaky Leaky Dutch is the one who stumbled upon Clara. And I actually was a little worried when they started introducing Clara. I'm like, Clara, you're starting to be a little more interesting than Dutch. Tone it down. <laughs> <laughs> But she was a really fascinating character, and I'm so excited to by the idea of her coming back. I just, I really liked her. Mm -hmm. I liked her a lot, too. Although I do have to ask, 
who on the writing staff loves the name Clara? Because I don't know if you remember, but in the fourth episode of the first season, the one with the surrogates, mm-hmm. one of them was named Clara. Hmm. That's a good question. I know that Emily Andrus wrote that episode. I don't think she wrote this episode, though. No, Michelle Leveretta wrote this one. That's a good question. I'm just saying. It's the second Clara we've met. But I'm wondering if Clara ever had a chance to modify Alice or any of her own mods, even though she was captured there, the way she talked about it. Well, we still don't know the circumstances under her capture, right? I mean, Mm -hmm. she might have already been into the body mod, so it was easy for them to install the shield. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. Hmm, That's a good point. But I think that her character is definitely a big breadcrumb for a future storyline, probably this season, if not this season, then the subsequent season, because she has that line about how if I ever find the factory again, you guys can be my wingmen to go take it down. So I think we're going to see more about, if not Claire specifically, body mods, people who maybe are enslaved. Again, this is not the first time we've seen hints of this phenomenon in the quad. So I think that's a big hint to a future plot line in this season is something having to do with the factory and all the body modifications. Mm -hmm. Well, that whole thing is fascinating, that whole concept of body mods and how, you know, how it crosses the line, a certain line into where it becomes illegal and by how many, how much of a percentage are you considered human or not. And, you know, it's just the whole concept of creating a level six and that kind of illegal modification. And here I was wondering, if she was already into the body modifications, but I'm pretty sure she did actually say that they're the ones who kidnapped her and installed the Alice and the shield. So. Yeah, they did say that, but it's, I don't know, maybe she had others before then. I think that's still a question to ask. It's but true. She did, she, say, she did say something about, you know, did you see all of my modifications? Yeah. It's possible she did some light modification before mm-hmm. she was captured by the Conovers, but they were the ones who made her into who she is today. It, you know, that conversation she has with with Johnny where he's trying to be like, no, I don't want you to do this. This is hurting you. And she's coming back with, no, I want to do this. This is my choice. I'm like, yes, we're hitting on lost girl themes if I will live I the know. life I choose. <laughs> and themes from this show. I mean, that's a big thing they yeah. mentioned a number of times in the first season. I think that was one of my favorite moments of this episode is, mm-hmm. is Clara saying, but this time I get to choose because that mm-hmm. is the big thing in the the series it seems to be is you know that ability to self-determine because we've we've gotten clear hints from how this class system works that there's not a lot of choice in that you know Mm -hmm. you are on westerly and you stay there for a certain number of generations and then supposedly you get bumped up to leith but that's just not always true or there's always yeah like has that actually happened well and they were gonna vote on whether or not they were going to still allow that to happen Mm mm-hmm so absolutely, this idea of choice and determining one's own fate is uh, also a big theme on Killjoys as well. But just when she had that particular line, I was like, yes, we're getting Bo's line. I will live a life of cho- choose into Killjoys. And that made me happy. Yeah. And even though Claire's been handed this incredibly crappy set of circumstances, how Johnny was talking about, well, I can try and get you to Potter. She's good people. She can help you take the mods out. And she's like, well, my mods are me. You know, yeah. she still has has taken what she's been dealt and going, well, no, this is, I choose to keep all of this. And that reminded me actually of episode four back in season one, because we have a Dutch and her perspective on these vessels are kind of like, why would you want to do this? I can give you a different life. But I forget her name now, but the, the one vessel who wanted to go back and help other vessels, you know, she was like, no, 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 this is my life's work. This is what I want to do. And Dutch was like, Okay, I don't understand it, but it's okay, your that's choice. your choice. Mm-hmm. And and I again, I see that with Clara, with Johnny and Dutch maybe assuming, why would you want these modifications that were first on you and not considering the possibility that she's come to accept them as part of her now? Mm-hmm. Right. And this is also, again, the fact that Klein is ostensibly the series villain, and his whole deal is he's basically really, really controlling of mm-hmm. of Dutch and what happens to her. I love that we got to that point where Davin was thought he was fessing up to Dutch and saying, you know, I lied to you. Klein was there. And she tells him, I know that. Mm-hmm. And essentially, he, she says, I chose y'all over him. Yeah. I love that moment, too, because I think that was in clear contrast to the beginning of the episode, right? She starts mm-hmm. off the episode. She's pretty much willing to, like, sacrifice them all. 
yeah, in she's an not attempt thinking to get to Davin. Yeah. But instead, at the end there, there's that moment. It, it's a crossroad moment. Like, I can either go fulfill my, my desire for revenge or whatever and go after Klein, or I can keep my people safe and stay with them. And I'm glad Dutch made the choice she did. Mm-hmm. And something that I like about Killjoy is that I think is sometimes a pitfall that a lot of shows fall into is when eventually, like, not even just the characters on the show, but even the writers on the show start treating the lead character as if he or she is infallible and everybody just falls into line as to what he or she, the leader of the show, Mm -hmm. wants to do. I think that's a big pitfall. You should not do that. Like, always be challenging that lead character's decision-making process and because that makes for more interesting dynamics between the characters it makes for a fallible lead character who is a heck of a lot more interesting than somebody who's just always right and i love that johnny and and other characters are willing to do that for dutch Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because yeah it's one of those things like she very well could have been right and they could have made it safely through the barrier on arkin but johnny and lucy had to go no this is too dangerous (laughs) Yeah, we might make it, but it's pretty likely that we're not going to. And so we're going to have to take this into our own hands. And and Mm -hmm. you're you're wrong to make this decision, whether or not Mm -hmm. that decision would have been successful or not, is sort of less important than the fact that you're basically willing to risk all of our lives for this. Like, yeah, it's it's a bad decision. Yeah. Again, like she could have been right. But that's, you know, that's sort of less important than the fact that it's a stupid decision to make. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I have to say, one of the things that I really love seeing return and just seeing on screen again is just how all the actors work together. The unspoken communication between the team was really good to see again. I just wanted to mention a few other things that made me really happy. Even though it was it was just in in Davin's dream, I loved the moment where they rolled in that little explosive device <laughs> and Lucy you hear Lucy's voice, you better start running in five, four, whoops. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> I was I am such a Lucy fan. I just I can't I even know. I swear she got more beautiful this season just you know, I don't know how many special effects shots they might have used, reused one or two from last season of Lucy flying through the quad, but I swear she looks so good, both inside and, you know, with the sets and with the effects showing the ship. And so they, I totally tweeted that. And Tamsin McDonough, she was like, yay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I loved that shot of when they were walking down those staircase outside of the, the gambling institution and Lucy comes hovering over them oh, like protectively. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That was fantastic. And how Lucy has uh, really, <laughs> Lucy is um, stuck on Clara. She goes, you're pretty attractive too for a human or something to that effect. <laughs> and Clara's laughing. I like that one, D- Johnny. Can we keep her? Yeah. <laughs> Two things. I think they have a new visual effects house this season. Mm. Okay. And another Johnny and Lucy and Clara OT3? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was a little worried, actually, because before I watched the episode, I saw somebody had tweeted Michelle Lavretta asking about, like, oh, are there going to be some, like, jealousy and relationship type stuff this season? I thought I might have mm. seen some tension between... Johnny and Lucy and Clara. I didn't see that. I thought no, Lucy no. loved Clara. <laughs> did. The only tension there is sexual. <laughs> <laughs> USD. We're back to the USD. But yeah, it was like love at first sight or love at first connection. I know. Between love Clara and Lucy. Uplink. And I like it. Yeah. <laughs> And I also, I loved all of Pri's aliases that the computer started pitting out, spitting out, especially Big Daddy Scrimshaw. Because <laughs> uh, of course it is. <laughs> of course Pri used that. <laughs> oh, Pri. Oh, I love Pri so, so much. Tweeted Tom, Tom, and I said, oh, I'm so happy Pri's back. Did he drink all the 50-year-old press talk? You know, if not, pass it down. And he goes, oh, honey, you know he drank all that in two days and didn't share <laughs> I love Tom. <laughs> Tom's great. I just, I can't wait to see what Pri is wearing this season. All of the pictures I've seen of the costumes this season look great. I know. 
I mean, they were great last season. It's not surprising. But it's like it's everything's kicked up a notch. Yeah, when you say they have a new effects house, it's like the costumes, the effects, everything looks amazing. They looked amazing in the first season. I'm, But it's like even more amazing. I'm just really impressed. <laughs> they set the bar very high. Mm-hmm. Also continuing with the season one trend of shirtless Davin. I know, Davin was so shirtless for so much of the episode. <laughs> and you do not sound disappointed. <laughs> well, it's more just, it's funny to me, because yeah. I just, I think back to the first episode, and I'm just like, when is, when is he going to put a shirt on? <laughs> <laughs> Why? It took a really long Why time. Why bother? <laughs> is it just me, or did Luke McFarlane, like, get more adorable? It was, it's like his eyelashes grew another <laughs> inch or something. <laughs> did they? Could they? <laughs> He's got long eyelashes. He does. I was looking at Aaron Ashmore's facial hair going, oh, the beard looks a little more grown in this this year. I don't yeah, know. it's true. Yeah. He, he has more beardier, of a true yeah. beard than just scruffy. Yeah. But I found it very He had attractive. like a scruff beard last season, but now it's like an actual full on beard. Though I wonder if that's maybe an effect of, supposed to be an effect of my brother's missing. I'm not going to shave for a few days. Maybe it'll be shorter next episode. True, but maybe it true. won't be. I don't know. I guess we'll find out. I liked yeah. it, though. So we haven't talked about the end, that last shot, and Davin's reveal about Dutch. What does that mean? Well, that's uh, that's a big question, right? Like, what was Davin seeing when he was having those visions on Arkin, exactly? And are these memories? That's what Klein said. I, I we don't know if we can time. trust that. I don't what? know. Were they memories? Were they manufactured memories? How long ago were they? Well, he said it was memories, but he made it sound like he was experiencing somebody else's memories, not necessarily his own. Mm. At least that's what I got out of it. But maybe I just misheard. I mean, I thought it was supposed to maybe be Klein's memory because he said it was a memory from a very long time ago or something like that. I'm like, how long ago could it have been? Because, again, at least Hannah John Common isn't that old. We don't actually know exactly how old Dutch is. Now I have more questions about how old Dutch is. Because, <laughs> like, how how old is very old, Klein? What's what's your scale for that kind of thing? <laughs> was, was were those Klein's memories? Because he said to Dad, "That's what I'm saying." Is, I this. think it is, but I don't uh, know. And what are the Scarbacks doing on Arkin? And what were the plants that they were carrying? So the religion in this universe seems to be very based on trees. Like mm-hmm. that is, mm-hmm. you know, by the trees. I hope you made your peace with the trees. So the religion is centered on trees. And it looked to me like they had little baby trees that they were that were dropping to the ground. That's what it looked like to me. Right. Does it have the trees have anything to do with the green goo? Is it an ingredient to the Well, green see, goo? that's what I'm wondering also is like maybe whatever it is is somehow, like, manufactured into the green goo, possibly. I don't know. Is it, like, a sacred tree? Like, a really rare thing? It's not like this is a world with a lot of literal trees, so... Well, because that's the whole thing with Arkin, though, is they were intending to terraform it, or at least this is the story, right? They were... The company was meeting to terraform it, something went wrong, and it's now uninhabitable, so they said. But that's the question, like, how much of that is true and how much of it is propaganda so that they can keep other people away from the planet? And maybe they're doing experimental things and, like, are the trees regular trees? That seems unlikely that they're regular trees, right? Otherwise, why would they seem so significant in this vision? Right. Arkin is a grower colony. Well, and the fact that Dutch was there, but she doesn't remember ever having been to Arkin, is that something she did while she was still under Klein's control and she doesn't remember? Because she was clearly killing people. Mm -hmm. And that's something that current Dutch is very, very reluctant to do. She does not want to kill people unless it's in self-defense. So is this something that she did from before she escaped Klein? Yeah. How old is this memory exactly? But yeah, I totally missed the first time I watched it that it was a memory. And I was like, is this the past? Is it the future? Is it a twin? Is it a clone? (laughs) 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 I'm still wondering, like, 
could there be another person out there who looks like Dutch and maybe it's not actually Dutch? Seems unlikely, but who knows? I know it seems unlikely. I'm just saying it. Does the green goo, does it do other things besides turn you into a level six? Does it erase your memories? Does, was were there well, other? But see, that's that the other thing is there is canonically in this show, there are people who can erase your memories. That's true. Like that's a big plot point. So mm -hmm. it seems likely that that's at play here. Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. So maybe she was coaxed into being involved in this confrontation, whatever it was, and then Dutch's memories were erased, and that's why she doesn't remember. Could be. Yeah. But thinking back on the episode, so here are what I see as some definite, they're likely going to explore these throughout the season. Definitely the, the you know, the lady and the black root and who might ultimately be in charge of the rack if it's not Klein at level six. The factory and where they do the body mods. And then this whole memory thing that Davin experienced on Arkin. Can you all think of any others that they you think might be likely? Well, I'm waiting for all the supporting characters to come in and what? Oh, that's right. Like they Potter. reminded us about Old Town and mm -hmm. that it was covered up. So we have to and Potter and Alvis, out. yeah, mm -hmm. Potter and yep. Alvis, and I, you know, and Pre and their backstories and how they will tie into the whole thing and Delsea coming in. So. They have said a number of times that the the supporting characters are really going to get some solid storyline stuff this season. Which so. really, really excites me. We'd love to hear your thoughts about this episode of Killjoys. You can email killjoys at askgenretv.com. We love getting voice messages. Please send them to us. You can record a voice memo on your smartphone and email it to us, or you can call our listener voicemail line at 972-514-7223. You can follow us on Twitter at Killjoys Podcast. We often live tweet during both the East and West Coast airings of Killjoys in the US and Canada. So again, Twitter, follow us if you want. We're also on Tumblr as Killjoys Podcast. The Quad is part of the Ask Genre TV family of podcasts to find our other podcasts about Orphan Black and Lost Girl, as well as our new multi-fandom podcast on which actually we are not current currently covering anything because Why Nona Earp just ended. But so far we've talked about uh, the 100. I did it again. The 100 <laughs> in Why Nona Earp. You can find those over at AskGenreTV.com. Thanks for listening. See you in the Quad. <laughs>